But uh, as you said, my name is Austin Smock. I've been involved in the esports scene for about seven years now. Um, I know I, I look a bit younger than I am, but uh, I'm actually 26. I started this when I was 19. Still a current Murray State student at the time. Uh, my sophomore year is when I really got going in April of 2012. Um, also, like he said, by day, I work on the telecom team at Caterpillar down in Nashville. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm going to tell you what I do at night and on my weekends, uh, and it's definitely not having a social life. It is working on this wonderful thing called eSports. So without further ado, get to my agenda here. Um, I'm going to break this down into three different parts. So the first thing I'm going to do is share my story with you all, how I got started, uh, what the collegiate years were like for me, and then also what I've been doing since then. Uh, then I'll jump into eSports, past, present, and future. Now that looks like a very broad topic, and that's because it is. Uh, and I'm not going to bore you with revenue numbers and viewer counts and things like that. I'm going to skim the surface of this massive industry. And I'm specifically going to focus on one individual thing to kind of frame the rest of the presentation. Um, if I was to talk about that whole timeline of eSports, we'd be here for two weeks or more. So I'm going to let you guys go before that. And then lastly, I'm going to tie it back to our region, uh, specifically the city of Murray and Murray State University. Uh, that's where I'm going to bring it all together and say how all this eSports stuff is going to come back to Murray and what it's going to do for the region itself. So moving on, uh, like I said, we'll start with the collegiate years. And uh, I've broken it down into three phases as well. And this is going to be a rather lengthy slide for me because I'm condensing three years of my history into a single slide, so you're welcome. Um, but something interesting that I found online before I came up here, you'll see this picture on the right. Uh, those are actually all the founders of the eSports club at Murray State University. We did that in April 2012, and we took that picture on the day it was founded. That's when we went to the student office, we signed the papers and made us official, and we were very happy about that, so we wanted to take a picture together and preserve that memory. Uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce everybody, starting on the left. That's Brad Riley. Uh, he was a fellow TSM graduate with me, and we actually still work together to this day at Caterpillar down in Nashville. Uh, the big guy in the middle there, that's Stephen Hewitt. He was a computer science major. We met him just walking around campus. Uh, at the time, there was a computer lab over in the business building where a lot of the computer science guys would hang out after class. Uh, we saw him and his friends in there talking about League of Legends, and we knew that was the guy we wanted to talk to, so we brought him on board. Uh, third guy there, that's me. Hi. A little bit younger at the time, a little bit skinnier as things go. And uh, I want to brag on Stevie Stewart on the right there. Uh, she was actually in agribusiness. So how in the world she got involved in gaming, you tell me. But agribusiness was actually part of us as well. And that actually kind of speaks to the, the global nature of esports. Anybody can get involved in it. It's for everybody. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. And I want to brag on her again because esports is also a very male-dominated industry, even to this day. Uh, so the fact that we were doing this back in 2012 and we had a woman leader, that's a very big deal. Uh, and I think Murray State was very far ahead of its time because of that. Uh, so that's us. And uh, I'll talk about phase one, which I call the discovery phase. This is when we were just getting started. Um, and basically what that meant is we're trying to see what's out there in the Murray State area. Who on campus is interested in this kind of stuff? What kind of gamer communities do we have around here? And most of all, what is the university actually going to let us do? Because as you'll see, as I'm going to talk about, that's actually a big thing. Uh, a lot of red tape we had to go through. And in some ways, a lot of universities around the world are still dealing with that today. But I'll get to that stuff later. Uh, so the first thing we did is we all kind of came together. We met each other on campus. And we realized very quickly that we all had a passion for gaming, and we wanted to do a little bit more with it. So we kind of sat down around that April 2012 timeline, and we said that we want to expand it. We want to see what we can make happen on the Murray State campus. Uh, and that was the, the foundations for the club. And from there, we started putting up flyers. We started reaching out on campus. Found probably about a dozen or so of us right at the start when we first got started. Uh, we started out pretty small. Uh, and from there, we took off with it. Uh, at the time, we were a League of Legends specific club. Uh, just by a show of hands, anybody know what that is? Yeah, I figured. That's one of the, it's one of the bigger games for sure. Uh, that was our main bread and butter title. We didn't really play anything else. It was all League of Legends for us. Uh, and that was fine because all dozen or so of our members at the start, that's all they wanted to play. So it worked out just fine. Um, so from there, um, we're like, well, we have this dozen or so people. What do we want to do next? So we wanted to make it more official. Uh, and that's where this phase two expansion comes into play. Um, and just to kind of close out phase one, the, one of the biggest challenges we faced with getting the club started was actually finding a place to play on campus. Uh, and not to say that you can't do that from your dorm room, but we wanted a community place where everybody could come together, play with their friends, all in one room, have that face-to-face -face communication. Um, 
We tried to do the business thing over in the business building. They shut us down. Uh, they didn't want us to use their computer lab, uh, which was fair because they actually had some issues at the time with people coming in there after hours. They were playing games while people were in there trying to do computer labs or study or whatever. Uh, so that was fine. We didn't want to disrupt those people either. Uh, we, we took a look at the dorm approach. Again, that had that kind of impersonal approach that we didn't want to do. We didn't want people sitting in their dorm rooms and just playing from there. We wanted them to come outside, network with everybody, and get to know their, their colleagues. Um, so we actually ended up going to the TSM building at the time, which is the, the CIT building now, if I'm correct on that. I know the acronym's changed since I was there. Um, but we, then we started looking around in that building because that really was the home for tech on campus in a lot of ways it still is today. Uh, so we started looking around at the rooms that were available. We had an auditorium. Didn't get to use that. Uh, that was off limits at the time. Um, so then we started looking around at the computer labs. There was probably three to four computer labs that we had our eyes on. And what those labs offered was they had PCs in the room already. They weren't, you know, top of the line Alienwares or anything like that, but they were in there. Uh, they had monitors available. They had keyboards. They had mice. So a lot of this hardware that we would want was already present in these computer labs. Um, we didn't get to use that either. <laughs> we got to use the mice and the keyboards and the monitors, but the PCs are a different story. Uh, so what ended up happening is we talked to Danny Claiborne, and it was specifically me and Brad. We were TSM uh, students at the time. And we thought that would give us a more direct connection with him as far as approaching him with this kind of idea. Um, so what we did is we came to him. We said, hey, we've got this club full of gamers, uh, but we know it's going to turn into more than that. It's going to be something bigger. And we want to have a place right here to do that. And it took some convincing. Um, Danny Claiborne back then had a little bit different mindset on it. That's changed since then. Uh, but eventually he did approve us to reserve one of those gaming labs, or PC labs, excuse me, uh, to set aside five hours every single Friday to where that was our time. We could come in there. We couldn't use the computers. We could bring our own. Um, and then we were free to use the peripherals that we had as well as the monitors. And we had internet connection in there as well. So we had pretty much everything that we needed. Uh, so that's basically how we got started. That became the hub for our weekly meetings. That's where we had all of our practices. Uh, our competitions were hosted in there. Uh, tournaments we had on campus in some, some ways were holding, held in there as well. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the beginning of something bigger. So moving into phase two, expansion, uh, this was the high time. This is when we had grown to over 30 people, which again is small, but for something that's getting started in, a, in an area that's kind of averse to gaming, averse to esports, having over 30 people was a big deal. Um, so when we got in that big, and I had kind of started to look around and see, well, yeah, we have this club on campus, but how do we tie in with the rest of the U.S. and Canada? How do we become part of something bigger? And that's where this logo at the bottom comes in. It's an organization called TESPA. And the way their support system works is it's kind of like a frat, but without all the parties. Because we're gamers, we don't do that. We like to stay inside, you know, avoid the sun, all that. Um, so basically what, what TESPA did for us is it ties us in with a huge collegiate network across the United States and Canada. Uh, at the time, I believe there were about 50 or 60 clubs back in 2012 that has since ballooned into way bigger than that. It's like over 200 schools now, if not higher. Um, and what they did is they provide you with event support. If you're going to have an event, you just send in a form to them, say, hey, we're doing this on this day. Give them a little bit of a synopsis of what you're doing. And then they'll send you out what they call a swag box, which has a bunch of like, gaming-related items in there. For Sometimes the game specifically you were having the event for. Other times it was an assortment of different gaming-related products. Uh, sometimes they would have hardware in there as well. They would have keyboards, mice, things we could give out to people for them to use. Uh, so a lot of the times, that's what our event prizing would come from, was from these packages that they would send out. Uh, and TESPA was not the only place we were getting that from. Uh, Riot Games, the Creative League of Legends, also had their own program at that time. And we could also get swag packages from them to hand out as events and things like that. Uh, so we had all this stuff coming in. It really helped us to get our feet off the ground, make people excited about our events, because we had stuff to give them. Um, so that's what we did. We joined TESPA. Uh, we brought it forward to the group. It was a unanimous vote to join TESPA. Everybody was very excited for that. Um, and that also opened us up to a support network of other collegiate leaders. We were all very new at this. We didn't really know what we were doing. We are kind of stumbling around trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, so now that we have all these 60, 70 different chapters across the United States and Canada to talk to, we can kind of get some different ideas, things that we're already doing. We could maybe improve upon those based on what other people have for us feedback-wise. Uh, so it's just a really good system to have to get off the ground. Uh, and likewise, joining TESPA, that meant we expanded our game library. We're no longer just League of Legends only. Hearthstone became our second biggest game by far. Uh, we immediately were able to host tournaments for those, drawing in 30, 40, 50 people. It was actually kind of insane. Um, and we also did more than that. We did a little bit of stuff with Heroes of the Storm at the time. We did some StarCraft. 
Uh, World of Warcraft PvP wasn't really a thing for us, but that is something that Tespa supports today, along with some other Blizzard titles. Uh, but for sure, League of Legends and Hearthstone became our main two, uh, and other stuff besides. So now we've got this monumental program going. We have a lot of support from our members. We've got this collegiate network across the United States and Canada. Uh, but then we get to phase three, and that's where things, you start seeing some cracks in the foundation. Uh, that's where a lot of our more senior members, the more passionate guys that were graduating, uh, a few of them were dropping out as well. That's just the way college goes. Uh, so our leadership cadre, I guess, was kind of shrinking. And it came to the point where it was just me. I was the only one still trying to make this thing work. And I was also coming up on graduation. So something that I've spent three years of my life building and dedicating a lot of time to, in the back of my mind, as graduation is getting closer and closer, I'm like, was all this for nothing? You know, who's gonna, who am I going to pass this off to? Who's going to carry on that torch? Uh, so needless to say, that made my senior year very stressful. Uh, it didn't help that I took a six-month hiatus to go study in Germany for that amount of time. Um, while I was gone, I basically passed it off to a good friend of mine called Major Cosby. Just had him kind of be the interim president while I was missing. Um, and then I came back to that very last semester I was at Murray, and that's when it really hit me that you know, something's got to be done. Um, so that's when I was really struggling a lot to not only have the, the motivation to keep the club going, uh, but also my, my passion for it kind of died off just a little bit as well, just because of all the stuff that was going on. Uh, but I did find somebody to take it over. That's why we're still here today, and I'm very happy for him. Uh, I found a freshman at the time called Matthew Archie. He took over for me. Uh, he was very excited as well, and that was something I looked for. I wanted somebody that was young. I didn't want to pass it off to another senior, of course, somebody a junior or sophomore. You want somebody that's still in the very beginnings of their college career, so when you give it to that person, they're going to stay there for a while, they're going to keep building, and you have the one single face leading the program for all that time. Uh, so he came in, he took it over, ran it for four years, um, and he actually got us up to the point where we are today that I'll talk a little bit about later. So I know that was a lot, but that was a, a three-year life story, so I'll move on a bit. And since college, this is what I do. So those four titles he was talking about, there they are. And I'll kind of do a brief overview of all these. So I'm the Commissioner of Competitive Leagues at AVGL, which is the American Video Game League. That's how I stay involved at Collegiate to this day. Uh, what we do is we host tournaments for League, Rocket League. Uh, we stay away from Blizzard titles because TESPA, of course, kind of has that on lock. Uh, we do Fortnite, Apex Legends. Anything that's not tied to TESPA directly, we'll support it. Um, and basically all you have to do is just be a full-time college student. You get a team of five or three, whatever the size of your game is, and you compete. And what I do is I manage all those leagues, I do the rule sets, I do any competitive rulings, I take care of registration, uh, the player support as well while we're having live matches going on. Uh, so it's a lot of stuff. And then at Heroes Hype, I joined them about three years ago. Uh, and I joined them specifically for Heroes of the Storm. They're a Heroes of the Storm based organization, uh, even to this day, even though that game's kind of dying off, and I'll get into that. Uh, but the production coordinator role is actually kind of new for me. I did that about four months ago. And what I'm doing there is I'm running the stream, I'm running the broadcast. So I'm the one switching the graphics on stream, I'm coordinating with the casters, giving them information, coordinating with the admins, doing the same thing, uh, getting information from the teams, anything I need to do to make the stream keep running, that's what I do now. Uh, before that, for about two years, I was actually the head admin for North America. And specifically, the, the one thing I want to talk about is I was actually the head admin for the Open Division. And what that was back in the day was it was a step below the Pro League for Heroes of the Storm. Um, so that was a big deal for me. That was really where I got a lot of experience, got to do a lot of networking and meet a lot of important people. Uh, since then, Blizzard has kind of killed Heroes of the Storm's eSports. They pulled out of it. And of course, that terminated that position for me, so I had to find something else to do with Heroes Hype. That's how I ended up there. Uh, the next one, I'm a league admin on the North America side for CCS, which is the Cyber Athlete Championship Series. Uh, that's more of the same. I'm just an admin. I work on the matches and things like that, but specifically for Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, and then the last one, I'm a part of the action squad for Super League Gaming. This is also a very recent thing. I've been with them for less than a month. Uh, but what that does is it's local to the Nashville scene. We'll have a lot of local events. And what we do there is we're basically the face of that event and also of the company. So we want people to come out. We want them to have a good time. We want them to be enthusiastic about building up the esports community in esports. That's what the action squad is about. Uh, then also I have some of my past positions down there as well. I actually used to be a content writer, believe it or not, for Dignitas. Uh, they have since gone on to be purchased by the 76ers, which is a big deal, and they're not the only organization to be involved with traditional sports teams, as you'll see later on. I used to be the managing director of Smite Central. I was basically running a small business. I ran the web portal, all the tournaments, uh, conducted all the business. I was the head guy for that. Uh, I was actually doing that while I was still in college. That was one of the main things that kind of helped carry my esports career forward after graduation. 
Uh, the FPL, something called Female Pro League. That's very interesting. I want to talk about that. Uh, that was a Call of Duty League specifically for female players only. There were no mixed teams. There were no males allowed. It was females only. And what that does is it gives them a space to come in without prejudice, without people nagging at them like online gamers do. And that gave them a safe space to show what they can do. Uh, and I'm still working on that today as well. The CCS has actually just kicked off their own female league just last night. Uh, I missed the first match day to drive up here. So, uh, but we're still doing that today. We're empowering women to get involved, not only as players, but in the industry as well. And then it goes to gamers. That was more of a database entry job. I basically just kept track of competitive matches, uh, kept track of the champion picks and things like that, and just logged into the database. Nothing special. Uh, but that's just to give you an idea of the amount of stuff that's out there. So this is the slide that I uh, am not going to talk about 20 years worth of stuff for. This is basically where the league structure is heading for esports as a whole. Uh, I broke this down in three phases as well. I like the number three. Don't ask me why. Um, so the way it used to be set up is something called relegation. All the pro leagues were doing this, and in some ways, some of them still are to this day. Not everybody has switched over to the franchise system yet. And what that was, it was a performance-based system. With League of Legends, as some of you are aware of, they had a 10-team league, and what they would do is the bottom two would be relegated through the relegation process. If you were in the bottom two teams, you basically got kicked out of the league, you have to go to the next step down, which for them is the Challenger Series. Uh, all the other titles have their own version of that. It's basically the semi-pro league. It's still a step above amateur, but it's not professional. It's in between. Um, so, and what that made happen is the people that were coming into these leagues that were set up with relegation, their investments weren't secure at all. You could come in, spend all this money on powerhouse players, put a star roster of five, five players together, and you could still be the bottom team. Because contrary to popular belief, you can't just throw money at something and have it work. So this is actually something that we saw happen with an organization called Team Ember. They came in, threw a bunch of money at five star players at the time, brought them in, did okay for a little bit, and then they tanked, ended up getting kicked out of the league, and that organization no longer exists because they basically ran out of money. And relegation had a lot of problems because of that. It started scaring away investors. All the risk-averse people wanted nothing to do with it. So a lot of the bigger orgs, a lot of investors were kind of backing away from esports, and that kind of was the first wake-up call for the industry that something needed to change. So that's where we come over to franchising. Uh, this is by far the popular model today. A lot of the bigger leagues, Overwatch, League of Legends, all those guys are switching over to this kind of system. And what that does is it gives you a permanent spot. You don't have to be in danger of losing that spot anymore. The only way you get kicked out is if you do something really stupid and they have to kick you out for PR reasons. Uh, other than that, you're in. Your, your investment is totally secure. Uh, so what that is, it drawed a lot of people with a lot of money, first off, and it also drew people that were not endemic to the space. That's where you see traditional esports guys coming in. You see tech companies getting involved. Uh, people that aren't even in those sectors, people that are just conglomerates, uh, anything Im imaginable, really. They wanted to get a piece of this. Uh, and where that's heading is they're going to have a home and away system just like traditional sports do today. Uh, a lot of the teams in the Overwatch League specifically, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit more, uh, they're actually going to start investing in home stadiums in their home city. They're going to build esports stadiums just like they have for traditional sports. So I'm going to let that sink in for a little bit. They're building ginormous stadiums to watch 10 nerds sit on computers and play video games. <laughs> So if you don't think this is serious, that's the first wake-up call for you. And what that allows them to do is build that local community. You have a local venue where they're having these ginormous events and sold-out arenas, and now it's their sold-out arena. And that allows you to build up not only a local fan base, but even people from across the globe. They want to come to your stadium. They want to watch your team play. They may not be able to travel all the time, but when you're having big regional events, big playoff matches, things like that, they're going to come and watch in person. Uh, so that enables you to do a lot of stuff that you couldn't do before now. So here's the Overwatch League that I was talking about. These are all 20 teams that are currently in the league, as, long, as well as with their owners on the side. And I'm going to pick out a few of those, because some of those are going to be interesting for you all. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the bullet points on the left over here. Initially, when this started, there were 12 teams in the league. Those spots sold for $20 million. Just let that sink in for a bit, too. $20 million to play video games. And they had that. And then last year, they actually expanded the league to 20. So they brought in eight new teams. And I want to point out that number at the bottom there, 30 to 60 million to buy those expansion slots. So it went up in value. There's no more of this 20 million buy-in. It went up to one and a half to three times the value of the initial spots, which were just a year before. So you can see the value of these spots, how quickly and rapidly that stuff increases. Uh, but kind of going through the list over here, I'm going to point out a few of these. 
Uh, so the first one we'll talk about is the second one, which is the Boston Uprising. Anybody know who Robert Kraft is? Does that ring any bells with the Patriots, maybe? Uh, he actually owns an Overwatch team. So that's the first sign. He was one of the first eight teams, as, or the first 12 teams, sorry, that got involved. Patriots were in there right off the gate. Uh, some other ones I want to talk about is the next one down, the Chengdu Hunters. Uh, this is a Chinese team. Uh, one of their owners is Huya. That's basically a streaming platform. We have Twitch over here. That's their version of Twitch. Uh, so that's one of the many tech companies that are getting involved. Uh, and they're also partially owned by Royal Never Give Up. That is a huge Chinese esports team. They've been around for a long time. Uh, since I was starting off in college, they've been there. By far the biggest brand in China. So moving down the list, you'll see a lot of these other ones too. You see Team Amy for the Dallas Fuel. You'll see Infinite Esports for Houston Outlaws, Cloud9 for London Spitfire. Any of you guys that are into games or into esports, these are names you recognize. These are endemic esports teams that have been around for years, almost a decade at this point, if not longer. Uh, so we have our endemic teams in there as well, but we also have new stuff coming in, like Robert Kraft with the Patriots. Uh, some other ones I want to talk about. New York Excelsior right here. Jeff Wilpon has time to the New York Mets. That's another traditional sport team. Philadelphia Fusion, a couple below that. You have Comcast involved. We may not like their internet, but we do like them supporting this stuff. <laughs> San Francisco Shock. Andy Miller is in there. NRG Esports, another interesting tidbit about them. Shaquille O'Neal, yes, that Shaq is a partial owner of NRG Esports. That's another thing of traditional athletes coming in here. Shanghai Dragons, NetEase, that's another tech company. They're very involved in the mobile game industry. Um, some other ones here. The Vancouver Titans are partially owned by the Vancouver Canucks, so it's not only football, but hockey is getting involved as well. And let's see, there was one more on here. The LA Gladiators, I want to point them out. And I'm probably going to butcher these people's names, but it's Stan and Josh Krunka. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, that is a huge sports conglomerate. They have the LA Rams, they have Arsenal, they have the Denver Nuggets, they have the Colorado Avalanche. All these different sports teams are in that one umbrella, and they're involved in this as well. So that's to show you that it's not just football either. All these different traditional sports are getting into this stuff, and that is a huge deal. It's something that makes me very happy, and I hope it gets you guys excited as well. So can I, can I ask a question? Hmm? So what do you get if you win the league? Uh, I believe it's about three million, three and a half, somewhere up in there. And of course, they split that up uh, between the top two teams or so. And then I think the first year it was only one million. So again, the next year, the prize pool was three times higher than it was in the previous year. And you see that a lot with eSports, the prize pool continues to go up for the most part. Just kind of depends on the game that it is. Uh, some of the games are struggling a little bit, they don't have as big of a following. So generally their eSports prize pools will stay the same, or in some cases kind of stagnate and decline a little bit too. Uh, but Overwatch and League of Legends in particular, those two are continuously on the rise. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, so to give you a little bit more of a snapshot here, I've got a then and now for five years ago. Uh, in 2014, I want to call that year out in particular. Not because that was when I was panicking trying to find a successor for my club, um, but that was actually when the first official varsity program was instated. Robert Morris University in Chicago, Illinois, that was when they got started. They were officially recognized by the university. They had scholarship support. They had everything going for them. Had their own arena on campus. They were the first big guys to come in here and actually make something official out of this. Whereas you fast forward to now, five years later, 130 different universities have that going. They have scholarships. They have multiple teams competing. A lot of them also have on-campus facilities, and that is only taken from NACE. I'll get a little bit more into NACE here in a second, but that's only one organization's numbers. I would say the number of schools with varsity programs is probably over 200, over 250. It's much higher than that. Um, back then, there also wasn't much competition. Ivy Law was basically the prestigious tournament of the time. That was the beginning of Collegiate League of Legends. Uh, we actually played in that as well when I was a student and a competitor as well. Didn't do so high, but we don't talk about that. Um, so that was the big tournament at the time, whereas you fast forward to now, you've got NACE, you've got TESPA. Collegiate League of Legends has exploded. It is a huge thing, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. And then you also have CSL. It's a Collegiate Star League. Uh, it's kind of similar to the AVGL that I work with. They host a lot of collegiate tournaments. Um, back then in 2014, nobody was talking about it. No news, no TV coverage. Most people didn't even know what this esports thing was, or if they did, they didn't care about it. They thought it was a joke. Now, 2019, ESPN is airing this stuff. Disney is airing this stuff. ABC has picked up on it. Specifically with ESPN, they were a stalwart supporter of something called Heroes of the Dorm. That was something that ran for four years, specifically for Heroes of the Storm esports on the collegiate level. And what that was was a tournament with all the universities across the US and Canada. And the five winning guys got a full ride scholarship to their university, no matter where it was. Uh, so that is 
a big deal. A full, a full ride is not something to laugh about in any scenario. And the fact that you can get that with playing video games is astounding to me. Um, and then also, going back to that Collegiate League of Legends stuff that I was talking about, the Big Ten Network, it's a huge sports network. They are now airing that stuff as well. And it's not just the Big Ten schools, it's all of them. If they have a match, they put it on there. And then there's also kind of a, an organizational shift as well. Back then, a lot of these clubs were student-led. They didn't really have a lot of faculty or uh, university support. Since then, that is a whole different story. You've got the full infrastructure. You've got coaches. You've got analysts. You've got team managers. You've got faculty involved that are supporting the team. A lot of these teams have facilities on site as well. That comes with psychologists, sports nutritionists, all this stuff to support these guys. And they're just in college. They're not even professional yet. So that tells you how big this stuff is getting just over the past five years. So this is where I'm going to start talking about our region in particular. Here, here's that NACE thing again. Uh, that's the National Association of Collegiate Esports. They're basically our current version of the NCAA. Uh, NCAA is not involved in collegiate yet. Maybe they will somewhere down the road, but right now uh, the leadership is not right. The connection between us and them isn't right, uh, but they are looking at it. So NACE is basically what we have in the interim. They're the governing body. Uh, they're a, an organization that is led by and for the students of the member chapters. Uh, so they have student council. They come up with their own eligibility requirements, their own tournament rules. They host their own events. They do it all, and it's led by students. So over on the NACE side of things, these are some of the chapters they have kind of in the Kentucky, Tennessee region. You've got Brescia and Owensboro, Campbellsville, Western Kentucky and Bowling Green. And then down on the Tennessee side, you've got East Tennessee, King University, and Milton College. And what's interesting about those is those are all closely related to one another, probably like a 20 to 30 minute drive away from all three of them. And they're right on the Virginia border. So they're all very closely connected with each other. And over on the TESPA side of things, we know what TESPA is. We've talked about that already. Uh, UK has a chapter in that. So does UofL. So your sports rivalries can you know, get involved as well. You're, and then you go back to Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee Tech is involved down in Cookville. You've got the University of Memphis. We know where that is. Uh, and then UT Knoxville as well. It's obvious where that is. All those guys are in TESPA. And these are just some of the ones that I picked out. There could be more out there that aren't involved officially with NACE and TESPA. But those are by far the two biggest organizations that I want to pull out. Uh, and I have an honorable mention down in the corner, NTSU. Just like I talked about, there are programs out there that aren't officially a part of these programs. NTSU has a very large and active program down in Murfreesboro. Um, I actually work with them quite a bit. It's the work I'm doing down in Nashville. Uh, they play League of Legends, Hearthstone, Overwatch, all the kind of stuff you would expect as well. But what I want to draw attention to here is you see where these places are. There's nothing really near Murray, is it? And that got me thinking, you know, what, what's our sphere of influence look like for the Murray State area when we start bringing this in? If you were to drive two hours in any direction from Murray State's campus, you could literally draw a line for that two-hour drive, make a huge circle, two hours in any direction. There are no official collegiate programs, nothing to this size at least. If there's something out there, we don't know about it. So that is the kind of pull that having this kind of program at Murray State is going to bring in. It's a huge sphere of influence. And that's not only for other colleges to maybe attract other students away from them, have them come play for you instead of these other schools. We also have to think of all the high schools in that area. There is a ton of high schools, not only in the Murray surrounding area, but also farther away from that as well. That gives you an incentive to pull those guys in, have them be a part of your esports program as well. So moving on, uh, I want to talk briefly a little bit about what esports means for students in the university itself. Uh, again, with the attract and retain, I talked about that huge area of influence that we have right now. That's going to help you attract new students at the high school and collegiate level and also retain them. Because if they're gamers, they're going to most times be interested in esports as well. If they know you have an esports presence on your campus, that gives them a reason to want to stay. And then that also gives them another way to be involved in campus as well. Uh, financial assistance. A lot of, as I was talking about, a lot of these schools have varsity programs with scholarships available. Not always up to the full ride level, but they generally offer something to these players. Uh, one I want to talk about in particular, there's one called Ashland University. Who's heard of this Fortnite game that everybody keeps talking about? Oh, come on, you guys have heard of it. Come on. <laughs> so Fortnite, they have a player called Chance. I've worked with him a lot through AVGL. He was given a full ride scholarship to play Fortnite. This is something that they consider a children's game for the most part. Uh, the esports scene for that is really not even taken off yet. It's, it's there, but it's not at the same quality, the same gravity as these other big titles. He was given a full ride scholarship to Ashland University just to play Fortnite. He's in, their, he's in their PC lab every day. He's streaming it. He's playing it. He's always there. Uh, so that's just another success story in my book for collegiate esports. Uh, you can tie this back into academic excellence. A lot of these varsity programs, like any other athletic program, they're going to have certain academic requirements to keep you in the program as a player, as a competitor. 
Uh, so that's going to give a lot of these gamers more incentivization, more motivation to actually become better students as well. And that's what we want to see. We want to see them not only be valuable teammates, but valuable students as well. And those things go hand in hand. And then exposure, if you've been in the esports industry, that's like the worst word. You never want to see that word. Uh, usually, as you're first getting started in the esports world, somebody will offer you a volunteer position, uh, and then they might pay you an exposure later on. They like to, they like to say that. They'll pay you an exposure. Uh, but this is actually it's legitimate. So since there's no esports programs in our whole two-hour-ish area around us, that is actually a big deal for us. It's going to get people talking about Murray State, not only Murray State, but collegiate esports as a whole. So that's going to not only bring Murray State up, but also collegiate esports along with it. Again, all this stuff goes hand in hand. If you support one thing, it helps bring up the rest of it. And it also gives you some other options for your career. Um, you, I'm an example of that. I was a tech student. I'm doing this stuff on the side. Uh, a lot of times, it's an easy transition for somebody from tech, from business, to go into esports. But I want to stress the fact this is major agnostic. If you're a photographer, they, they need people to come to the events, take pictures of the players, the crowd, things that are happening, people lifting the trophy. They want photographers for that stuff. If you're in graphic design, all these esports teams need graphic designers for jerseys, their websites, you name it, there's, there's a need. You can also be a writer. A lot of these people put out a specific business communications. They have writers as well that share news about the organization, news about different games, what's happening in the scene. You can be a writer in this as well. Uh, so really, your career options are pretty much limitless. You don't have to be a professional gamer. You don't have to go the competitive route. You can do like I did, because I'm washed up. Um, and then you can just do other things. You can be an admin. Uh, you can do production. You can just be more involved in the business side. There's so many different things you can do that I can't list at all. And then my almost last slide here is I want to tie this back to regional businesses a little bit. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because a lot of this is probably common sense to you all. And none of this is going to blow your mind. Uh, but I do specifically want to talk about some of the different opportunities you could have. So with Murray State, even when I was just having the club that we had that wasn't official by any means, we were working with local businesses. We had a card shop in Murray called Dragon Sword Gaming. They actually have a location here in Paducah now as well. Uh, we actually had a partnership with them where we would come out and host Hearthstone tournaments in their store. So that gave our guys a chance to come out and be exposed to other hobbies like tabletop, collectible card games, all that stuff. I know it's more nerdy stuff, but we're nerds, so we, we embrace it. And then that also gave a chance for their store members to see what we're doing. So we both benefited from that. We get more exposure to traditional gamer hobbies, and they also have a chance to see what esports is about. And that's the kind of stuff you can get into with this. Uh, we had other things to where people would basically just send us a small amount of money. We could use that at wherever we wanted to. Uh, Dignitas, the company I used to work for, actually sent us a, a small amount that we could use on pricing however we saw fit. The only thing we have to do is put their logo on our stream, and that's where the advertising comes into play. You can send these guys wristbands, you can send them t-shirts, you can even provide catering for their events. There's a lot of ways to get involved with these events. And a lot of the times, most people just want the advertising. They just want their name up there as a supporter, and that benefits both parties. And then, of course, the obvious stuff with Murray State building up this program, you're going to have more students coming in. That translates to more consumers. You have people traveling in from out of town to come to the events that we might be having. That's going to be more people coming in, which in turn translates to local growth for the city of Murray and the surrounding area. Again, none of that's rocket science. That pretty much makes sense. Um, so in closing, I said the Seasports stuff was coming. That is a picture from Murray State University today. And I'm going to thank Dwayne Dyke sitting back there. He sent me that last minute last night, and I managed to get it in here. Um, I didn't have that back in the day. There was no official dedicated gaming room. We didn't have a space like this. Uh, so it really makes me happy to see that seven years later, that that is happening. Um, we have players coming in there every single day. I'm in their Discord. I can see the activity going on. Uh, they're really excited about this room, and they're using it every single day. But that's just the beginning. We don't have an arena on Murray State yet. We're not an official varsity program just yet. So that is the beginning of something that could be much bigger than that. We could have an entire room full of like 30, 40, 50 PCs if they get the support and the funding that they need. And I'm really hoping that they do. So I did have a video for you guys. Um, the audio is probably not going to work, so I'm probably just going to skip over that. Um, but it was basically just a way for me to close out. Um, and what that video talked about was there's a lot of opponents to this stuff in the mainstream media. You will see them bashing esports almost on a weekly basis. They'll tell you that games are a joke. These are kids. They don't deserve to be on television. And hopefully what I've told you here today shows you how wrong they are and that this is here to stay. So thank you very much. And any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's a lot uh, in the in the esport uh, scene that's very targeted towards universities mm -hmm. that that I talked to you, the majority of uh, esports students here. Just curious about what uh, if you have any vision or thoughts about what that looks like in the K-12 space. 
So there is something out there right now. Uh, it's called the HSEL. It's the High School Esports League. They're just now getting off the ground. It's not really that built out yet, but that's kind of where they're heading towards. They want to be the equivalent to like the AVGL or the CSL at the high school level. And that's kind of the same thing. They're making sure that the, the high school teams have the support they need at their school, making sure that they have the resources they need, uh, prizing support in some cases as well. And they also facilitate a lot of the regional tournaments they have at these high schools. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't really have a presence in this area. It's mostly out in the west, in like the California and the Texas area where Collegiate Esports was born. Um, and those areas today are still kind of more of the hotbed. It's where a lot of the more successful programs are at. But uh, the HSEL, definitely, I would expect them to expand over here sooner or later. Any other questions? So, it's probably Sean that posted it on LinkedIn, uh, but that AVGL got bought. Yes. Uh, what does that mean? Well, first of all, <coughs> explain who bought who, and, and, but what does that mean? I mean, what was the significance of that? Okay, so that had uh, some career implications for me as well, so I can definitely talk about that. Um, the AVGL was recently bought out, I believe, last week uh, by a company called Boon TV. That is a direct competitor to Twitch TV. Uh, of course, right now, it's nowhere close to the behemoth that Twitch is, but that's what they want to get to. Uh, and they basically have a streaming platform of their own, but it also has a built-in client. And what that client does is it runs on top of your game, whether it's Fortnite, League of Legends, Overwatch, anything that you have, it'll support it. And it can pull team stats, player stats, what's going on in the game. It can pull that directly out of the game client without any interaction from anybody else. Uh, so th that's what their platform's trying to do. It's a more esports focused streaming service, uh, just because they have access to those kind of stats. And what the buyout meant for AVGL is that the AVGL is now absorbed into Boom TV. So the AVGL officially doesn't exist anymore. There's still some lingering remnants out there. We're doing some stuff this semester. Um, but that's where everything went. Boom TV kind of sucked that stuff up under their umbrella. And AVGL basically is just going to get repurposed for what they want to do. We're going to branch out and help them get their streaming platform with uh, some exposure to the collegiate scene. We're also going to use our connections with existing collegiate campuses to get them more exposed to Boom. Uh, things like that, of that nature, that's what, basically what that buyout meant for us. We're just working for them now. Of the, the games that you compete with, do you have those limited into just a certain number of games? And what's the percentage of those mostly combat games? Uh, and in the education, do you actually bring in coding or anything that's working on those games? Uh, it's really up to the collegiate program themselves. Um, most of the games are combat-based just because it's team-based. There has to be some kind of combat involved. They're fighting over an objecti objective. Uh, so whatever that takes the form of, whether it's a shooter, whether it's a more cartoony action kind of game, uh, there's always some kind of combat involved for the most part. Um, so that kind of takes care of the competition piece of it. And then as far as tying that back into education, off the top of my mind, I know we didn't do anything like that at Murray. Uh, but there are some scenarios that I could see that working, like if you have access to API, not only to the game, but like a streaming service for like Twitch, YouTube, something like that. You could do some coding with those APIs to link things together between that game and the streaming service. Uh, so maybe you want to give a student a project to make some kind of in-game overlay that pulls stats from the game and puts that on their stream. You could do that with APIs and coding. Um, I don't know if any specific examples of that happening, but that is one example that you could do. So in the lead, This is a, the home and away is a virtual thing? No. Nope. Do they actually travel? It's a physical travel. Um, so they're not quite there yet. 2020 is really going to be the launching pad for that home and away system for Overwatch specifically. Uh, there's also a Call of Duty League. I'm sure most of you have heard of Call of Duty. It's been around for over a decade. Uh, Call of Duty is going to be using the same kind of format that the Overwatch League is. They're going to have their own franchise system with home and away games. Uh, I don't think that will quite be ready next year, but 2021, you'll probably see that kicking up as well. And yes, that is, that is including physical travel. They build these arenas. The teams will travel to and, to and from those arenas. They have home and away games, just like traditional sports. And that includes international travel as well. Those teams over in China, Korea, Europe, all the US teams and Canadian teams are flying over there and vice versa. So it's truly a global phenomenon. Uh, and it's going to keep growing. It's going to stay that way. No, there's much more involved than that. Um, so when you have a collegiate team, the first thing, one of the main things you're going to be doing is research on other teams. 
So you're gonna sit down and do what we call bot review, just like you would in traditional sports. You're gonna pull up gameplay videos of them at other tournaments, maybe it's their scrimmages, maybe it's something they just streamed one night. Uh, you're gonna look at that and you're gonna analyze what they're doing in that game and try to formulate strategies around that. Uh, what the teams are doing is they generally have strategies in mind. They're playing a certain type of way. Some teams are more aggressive, some teams are more passive. Some guys are more objective focused, some aren't. Uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole list of different play styles out there. So a lot of study and research goes into it. Um, and that also applies to your own gameplay. If they're playing in a tournament, they don't just play in the tournament and you know, get a couple rounds deep and then lose out and that's it. No, they go back and look at their gameplay, they review it. What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? Why was this specifically a mistake? And they'll look at specific scenarios in the game. Like say you're 32 minutes into a game, there's a big objective fight happening. They will break down that objective fight, they'll look at where every single person was, what everybody was doing, what resources were available in that game, and they break it down to that detail and try to see what ways they can improve their gameplay for next time. Uh, there's also the team play aspect. They're teammates, they need to like one another. Uh, so that's where the coaches and the managers come into play. That's where the psychologists come into play if there's any deep-seated issues with those players. Uh, so, I mean, I could talk about it forever, how much goes into it, but I hope that gives you a little bit better idea. Um, not really. Um, there are some leagues out there that will gate you based on the team's overall MMR rating. That's basically their performance level. Um, that's something that you can pull from the game itself by looking at their player pages. Uh, you can do that online. There's some stuff in game you can look at as well. Um, there are some leagues that will do that, but that's definitely not the norm. Uh, a lot of the times what will happen is just open enrollment leagues. If you've got a team with a university, you just sign up and you play, and whoever you get in your bracket is what you get. Um, there's some teams, or some leagues rather, excuse me, where if, if they've been established, they've been doing the same league over and over, they'll start using like a hard seeding or a soft seeding system based on previous year's results. Uh, so they'll identify the top teams in the league and try to seed those guys accordingly. So then the, the lower seeded or the lower performing teams will actually have some chance to get, you know, one, two, three rounds into the tournament before they get knocked out by the big guys. Uh, but for the most part, there's not really a hard handicap, no. No, basically it's just kind of down to the teams to keep track of the performance levels of their players. Uh, they're not going to bring in somebody that they don't trust to perform well. Um, and there's not really um, any official setting or any official rule that says, hey, you can't bring in a player to compete if he's below you know, this performance level, this performance rating. There's just nothing like that. We want it to be an inclusive atmosphere, and that's why we don't really have that stuff in place. Okay, there's a lot of hands. Uh, I think yours has been up the longest. Is it just one of the Fortnite tournaments? Mm -hmm. So the, the less serious answer is taxes, uh, because all that money he won is going straight to taxes. Uh, I think of the three million that he won, he's gonna get like 240,000 of that. Uh, but all jokes aside, uh, that was the first major Fortnite tournament that they had. Uh, and also got a lot of exposure to that game. And the fact that, what, he was like 16 years old and won that tournament, that shows you that this can start way before collegiate. These are high school age kids out here doing this kind of stuff. And that's how he plays into all this stuff. It can start whenever you want it to. It doesn't have to be college, it doesn't have to be high school, you can even trickle this down to the middle school if you want to. You can start them any time that you want. The talent is out there, you just gotta find them. Uh, whenever you first started your club, what was your strategy about getting your team's name out there and finding other teams in your area that are competing with this? Okay, so the first thing we had to do was see what do we have. So with all these players that are playing League of Legends, what do we think makes the best team? Uh, we tried pulling just the highest rated players, kind of like we talked about, whoever had the highest MMR. We just put them directly on the team and saw how it worked. Uh, when you have the five top performing players in your club on a team, you can kind of see how egos might butt heads there. Uh, so that didn't work out so well. So then what we started to do is we took a mix of the top performers and then also people that were good team players. So maybe you don't do so well in game, but you're good at shot calling, you're good at strategizing. You know how the game itself works, even if you can't actualize that in some cases. Uh, so that actually worked out a lot better for us. We were able to get further in tournaments doing that than we were before. Uh, so really, it's just kind of, you have to find what works for you, and that's what we did. We didn't have a, a game plan going in. We were all very new to it. We didn't know how any of this stuff worked. Uh, so it was mostly just trial by fire, figuring out what worked, and eventually we found something that did. And then did you have a second question that I forgot to answer there? Yeah, like in terms of finding like, other teams in areas to play with, 
Okay, yeah. Like, uh, how did you, while you served back then, there weren't as many mm -hmm. as there is now, but how did you find anybody else to play with that wasn't just like online games? Yeah, it was very scarce back then. Um, that was something I struggled with a lot, was finding other universities or just other groups in general that we could scrim with. Uh, and sometimes they even had to go outside of collegiate. These were people that weren't college students. It was just five guys that had a team and they wanted to practice with us and that's fine. If you want to practice with people that aren't in the collegiate scene on your own time, there's nothing against that. You can practice against whoever you want. Uh, but naturally you're going to get more out of practicing against other colleges that have similar teams as you. Um, so back then I was specifically looking at Western Kentucky University. Uh, they were one of the closer schools to us at the time. Uh, and they also had a, I knew they had a gaming group on campus, I just had to find them. So I was scouring their social media, so, social media. I was looking through their online presence, trying to find a contact for these guys. Uh, eventually I did. Uh, we had some talks, but we were never able to work out anything. We didn't have any, you know, interregional lands between us. Uh, we did practice a few times, but that was really as far as that went. Um, and that's normal. You basically are just trying to see what's out there, see what both groups want to do. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but yeah, we basically just put out feelers and figured out what we could find. So that is a big thing. Um, Esports as general, especially for uh, event organizers, you're generally operating at a loss. Um, it's very hard to recoup profits or any kind of revenue as an event organizer. You can't stay in business. Yeah, it's very hard to do, but with these teams in particular, since they have a franchise slot, that 20 million, they're not looking to recoup it right away. It's five, 10 years down the road. And they get that back through merchandise, through ticket sales at these stadiums that they're building. You also have streams. They actually do get revenue shares from that. A lot of the games will also have uh, items in the game itself that you can purchase, such as like skins, uh, other items in the game itself that you can actually contribute back to those organizations that way. That's another avenue, avenue for rev sharing. Um, you can get other money back through sponsorships. Uh, Toyota, a lot of these other big companies are actually coming in and giving money to these teams in return for like commercials, uh, quick ads with the players, things like that, just sponsorship content basically. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. I'm not super qualified on it because like, I'm not that invested in the esports scene just yet, but that's some of the avenues they can take. But generally, uh, it's not going to be a quick ROI. It's going to be something you have to take years to recoup that kind of that money going in. Yeah. 